So your patient has chest pain, what do you do? So for this video, we're gonna be talking about a secondary assessment for a patient with chest pain. We have already completed our primary assessment, which includes the ABCs, the initial set of vitals, history taking, and treatment and transport decision. We have another video on patient assessment that we can provide a link below. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we're gonna start off once we made that transport decision and we're en route to the hospital. For my secondary assessment for a patient with chest pain, what I'm really trying to do is do a very thorough physical assessment, a, an investigation of the chief complaint system, which in this case would be cardiovascular, but I also want to rule out other body systems such as respiratory, abdominal, things of that nature as well. So I'm going to start off with that thorough physical assessment and ask a lot of questions specific to the cardiovascular and respiratory system. So one good acronym that I like to use a lot of times with about any patient, but especially my chest pain patients is an OPQRST. So O being onset, P provocation or palliation, Q quality, R radiation, S severity, and T for time. So the way that I'll phrase these questions will be, how long ago did this chest pain start? Was it sudden or was it gradual? for the P, palli palliation, provocation. Uh, is there anything that makes this chest pain better or worse? Q for quality, can you describe this pain to me? Um, and if they aren't able to really describe that pain, try to get them to you know, use one or two word sentences. And then R for radiation, does that pain go anywhere or can you point to it in one specific spot? S for severity, can you rate that pain on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst pain in your life? Because if you give them the option, they're gonna tell you everything's the worst pain in their life, right? They're gonna give you a 22 instead of you know, an accurate number. And then T for time, when did this chest pain start? Try to get an accurate timeline of this chest pain. And then I usually like to add in, has this pain changed over time at all since it started? So the next set of questions I generally will ask my cardiovascular patients is, have they felt like they were gonna pass out today or have they passed out? At that point in time, generally I'll look for any sort of trauma. Have they bitten their lip? <clears throat> have they, do they have any abrasions or cuts anywhere that looks like they may have fallen? And at that point, if, if they are able to, I will take what I call an orthostatic set of vital signs. And what that is, is where you'll take a set of vitals, blood pressure, heart rate, SpO2, while they're sitting down or laying down in their original position. Then I will have them stand up for at least a minute, and then I'll take another set of vital signs, including heart rate, blood pressure, and SpO2. And what I'm looking for <clears throat> when I do this is to see if their heart rate rises or their blood pressure drops. And if that is the case, that tells me that they may either be dehydrated or that there's something else going on. After I've taken my orthostatic set of vital signs, I'll continue my assessment on the patient. Generally, again, I will listen to lung sounds. I'm a bit at, big advocate of listening to lung sounds in the primary assessment, but I'll kind of reassess that in my secondary. Again, taking a listen to all four quadrants of the lungs, listening for rails, bronchi, wheezes, in a patient that's complaining of chest pain specifically, I wanna rule out they're not in any sort of heart failure. So in that case, we would have signs of fluid overload, such as rails, or some people call it fine crackles. At this point as well, I'm gonna uh, assess pedal pulses and peripheral pulses, generally at least radial pulses in both sides, uh, ruling out things like unequal pulses, uh, unequal blood pressure, so it might be a good time to get a blood pressure on that other side as well. And then after that, uh, we are going to kind of work into ruling out other body systems. So do they have a complaint of shortness of breath with this? Do they have a productive cough? Uh, do they, does their chest pain get worse when they get up and move around, or do they get short of breath when they move around? Do they have things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain? We want to really rule out other body systems at this point to make sure we're getting that complete uh, history. And then while they're you know, up and moving around or we're assessing that patient, we can assess for pedal edema, so another sign of fluid overload. If they have that swelling in their legs 
or on the tops of their feet, then we know that there's probably some sort of congestive heart failure aspect to this patient as well. So at this point in the call, we want to expose our patient, kind of taking off that shirt or unbuttoning a few buttons to expose their chest. And what we want to do is look for things like medication patches, uh, a defibrillator or internal pacemaker, which would look like a bulge on the upper left or the upper right portion of the patient's chest. They should know about this, uh, but it is important to look for and ask about if you do see it. And then we can ask things about the patient's family history. Do they have a family history of coronary artery disease? Uh, do they have a family history of heart attacks, strokes, high blood pressure, things like that? And then ask about the patient's history as well, their social history. Do they smoke? Do they drink? Um, have they had previous episodes like this in the past? And so what we want to do is really relate this current episode to past episodes. And the way that I will generally ask those questions are, does this chest pain feel like a previous heart attack or have you had this chest pain in the past? Or how is this episode different than a previous episode? So at this point in our secondary assessment, in my mind, I'm trying to create a few different what we call differentials or what I think may be going on with the patient. In a patient presenting with chest pain, my top differentials are typically an AMI or a heart attack, angina, which is basically chest pain that gets better uh, with rest, things like congestive heart failure, or even something like a pneumonia or a respiratory disease that's presenting itself with chest pain. With my differentials in mind, a patient that you know has the classic AMI presentations, they're going to be saying things like that crushing chest pain radiating to the left or right shoulder or maybe up to their neck. They're going to have that pale, cool, diaphoretic skin. That's kind of the classic presentation. Obviously, we have to think about our populations that don't always present that way, our elderly patients, females, patients with a history of high blood pressure, and our diabetics but that's kind of the classic presentation of an AMI that we'll be able to obtain from our secondary assessment. Patients that are presenting with things like congestive heart failure, that's why we listen to lung sounds, listening for rails or fine crackles, especially in the bases of their lungs, looking for the things like pedal edema. Uh, generally with their history, it's gonna be something with a longer onset than an AMI. They you may notice in the house that they sleep upright or they have to sleep in a recliner at night, uh, that they may be very positional on if they have shortness of breath associated with their chest pain. So orthopnea is the term for that. So if they have to be sitting upright or else they get short of breath, we can be thinking about things like congestive heart failure. And then on the respiratory side, we need to rule out respiratory disease as well. So if they have pneumonia or some sort of asthma attack, things like that. That's why we listen to lung sounds for wheezes or ronchi or those coarse crackles. Patients presenting with a productive cough for a few days can have associated chest pain with this as well. So we really want to rule out differentials during our patient assessment and that's why it's so important to have that thorough secondary along with our primary assessment. We want to gain that total clinical picture of our patient throughout this entire assessment and transport. So at this point, when our assessment's been completed and we're getting ready to treat our patient, we're gonna use what we've learned from our patient to guide our treatment plan. And so for a patient in this video, complaining of chest pain that we've probably decided is going to be an ACS, acute coronary syndrome type of patient, our treatment for that would be aspirin and nitroglycerin. And so for aspirin, we're gonna give them four 81 milligram tablets so a total of 324 milligrams. We're gonna have that patient chew and swallow that medication. For nitroglycerin, it's gonna be 0.4 milligrams and it's either gonna come in a nitro spray or a nitro tab. And one spray is 0.4 milligrams and one tab is 0.4 milligrams. We have done a video on this as well and we can put a link to that in the uh, description. But what we wanna do before we administer any sort of medication is go through our indications and our contraindications. So for aspirin, some of the contraindications are going to be obviously an allergy to that medication, but if they have any active GI bleeding disorders, any dark tarry stools, bright red vomit, things like that, we wanna rule that out before we give that medication. And for nitroglycerin, this is one of the bigger contraindications of all of our EMT medications. 
We do not want to give nitroglycerin for a patient with a systolic blood pressure below 100 or any recent ED medication use. And so we're giving these two medications for different reasons. Aspirin, we're going to give this medication to uh, stop the formation of a clot and kind of to slicken the blood. And for nitroglycerin, we're going to give this for the vasodilatory effects and to take that uh, myocardial oxygen demand off of the heart. So we're giving those for two very different reasons. And I see a lot of students that give, say, aspirin and not nitro, or they give nitro and not aspirin. But we need to understand the pharmacology of these two medications that we give them both together in ACS patients if there are no contraindications. So a lot of times on these cardiac calls, depending on where you work, there is going to be a paramedic either as your partner or you're going to intercept with a paramedic. And so as an EMT basic, it's really important to understand what's going to probably happen once that paramedic gets there so you can set that uh, patient up for success to be ready for that paramedic to be there. And so what's gonna happen when the paramedic shows up, they're probably gonna ask a lot of the same questions that you already did uh, but then they're going to do things like a 12 lead EKG to determine if the patient is having an active myocardial infarction. And they're also going to start one, if not two IVs. And so as the EMT basic, it's, it can be important to know how to set up for an IV and how to place a 12 lead, which we have done videos for those as well. And then that patient is going to be under the care of that paramedic at that point. So it's really important to give a good handoff report to that paramedic and give the full history and everything that you found during your secondary assessment to that paramedic so they have the full clinical picture for their treatment plan as well. Hey everybody, thanks for watching today. I hope you gained something out of this video. Let us know in the comments what you wanna see for future videos. We really love making these videos for everybody, so uh, we really appreciate the comments and the feedback that we get. So have a good day. Yeah! <laughs>